Welcome to uh, another edition of Sci-Fi, the uh, weekly show every Friday on Sublation Media that looks at politics and culture through a kind of analytic, psychoanalytic lens. Uh, I was in Belfast yesterday, so this is a slightly different episode where I interview Jameson Webster in person, uh, and uh, she's one of the most important, really, psychoanalytic thinkers and theorists, but also a clinician, and we had a fascinating talk about her new book, Disorganisation and Sex. It's a really thought-provoking, controversial book that deals with how culture misunderstands sex and sexuality today. We talked about toxic masculinity, we talked about childhood sexuality, sexual abuse, and her experience as an analyst, as well as her ideas and theories of why we're getting these things so wrong. Um, so she's a really interesting thinker, and thank you so much for listening. I uh, hope you enjoy the episode. So yeah, I mean, first maybe just tell us how you came to this book and what the kind of basic uh, idea of, of it is. Mm-hmm. Um... Well, the book actually is um, a collection of essays previously published and then um, rewritten, reorganized, um, smatterings of writings. And it was the editors, really, who wanted to put to me that I had done, um, in addition to the academic work I do and the books that I do, I have done a lot of writing in a lot of different places and that, you know, people go, like, mining on the internet for this stuff and wouldn't it be nice to put it in one place? Yeah, yeah. And then they themselves kind of saw this general theme, that on the one hand, I have a real concern for problems with institutions, institutionalized forms of psychoanalysis in particular, the problem with the psychoanalytic institution, questions about democracy, questions about group psychology and politics. Um, And then on the other hand, I'm really obviously interested in sexuality and psychoanalysis. And that Mm. there's, um, I think they kind of took their cue from the first paper in the book, which is a very old paper from 2013, um, called The Disorganizing Force of Desire. It's actually a retitled. Um, and in this paper, it says that the fundamental understanding of desire in psychoanalysis is that it, it, it's disorganizing, it's disordering, it um, is messy, and that it makes things like identity, institutions, orders, it it breaks them apart in a way that's actually very important because it it keeps us from our tendency towards reifying forms of power. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also why it's repressed, why it's attacked, um, why people's different sexualities are so terrifying. Um, Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, well, no, and this is what what I really loved about the book, which I think is, is absolutely brilliant. I mean, is this connection between, as you said, like politics on the one hand and contemporary social life in capitalism and then uh, on the other hand sexuality and how these things kind of combine and um, you know I mean the the book I thought we would talk about some of the kind of um, types I suppose of, of sort of flare-ups of this disorganization of yeah. sex that sort of arise or, or, or in our society today things like sexual abuse childhood sexuality but what you just said reminded me of um, the section in the book about toxic masculinity um, and I thought it was interesting that you said that you don't really sort of believe in toxic masculinity. You more believe in, I think you said, toxic institutions, toxic sort of structures and so on. Yeah. And th- that occurs to me as to be a really important way to think about this relationship between politics and sexuality. So what, what do you mean by saying that? Like, in a, what is this difference in the approach to toxic masculinity to, compared to sort of the, the general way in which this, right. this term flies around? Yeah, I mean, I, I I was concerned with the way that masculinity was being reified. I mean, one of the core insights, I think, of Freud is that gender is constructed. Um, it's very Judith Butler-esque, mm-hmm. and I think she takes this from Freud and from Lacan. And if you decide that masculinity is toxic, you're essentializing masculinity, and then you're condemning half the population. Mm-hmm. And so you have women who might love men confused about that, or women who might love women but have fathers and are confused about that, and then you have men who are confused about what it means to be toxic. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about this because it's as if, um, I don't know, just by being a man, one could be toxic. (laughs) And it's not that I don't understand the problems of patriarchy. (laughs) It's not that I don't understand the problems of white supremacy. It's not that I don't understand the problems of mansplaining or entitlement, or indeed even the problems of phallic sexuality. But to reduce this to toxic masculinity, I think is a real problem. 
you know, versus to see the institutions that put something mm -hmm. in place that allow these different forms to be identified with, either by a male or by anybody. Yeah, right, 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 right. So it's, it's very much not a sense of like a defense of men or something like right. that. It's, it's no, it's not. It's more that like you know the 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 greater problem is a kind of structural political one, right? So yeah. Which allows. So it's more like is it more like sort of seeing toxic masculinity as a symptom rather than. Absolutely. as a kind of cause so like yeah. it's like psychoanalysis can help in your view to sort of reveal these structural patterns because I suppose in a sense that's different from some people's understanding of psychoanalysis as something which kind of always looks inwardly at the subject and their own desires and their own personal situation whereas what you're saying is that actually in, in a sense in a weird in the opposite way psychoanalysis can be the thing which shows us how structural these symptoms are and how political absolutely. they are. Absolutely. It's really important because I think the idea of psychoanalysis is simply kind of a navel-gazing individual enterprise is wrong. And if you look at Freud's work across the span of his life, he was it was very important to him to constantly comment on the relationship between sex and civilization. I mean, one of his earliest articles, like sexu uh, Sexual neurosis, neurosis and Modern Nervous Illness, is essentially talking about the dialectical relationship between sex and civilization and the reinforcing of illness in the human being by virtue of the way in which society treats sex or sexuality or human beings in general. Um, and Freud also then worried in the other direction. He worried that certain kinds of neurotic patterns, especially those that create anxiety, were going to erode the better social institutions. You know, so it was this 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 bi-directional concern that I think follows him all the way to his most important book in my mind, which is Civilization and Its Discontents. Right, and in that book, it's not like the question of guilt, of sadomasochism, of self-destructiveness, of the death drive, is not just an individual problem. It's a problem across civilization and society and the different structures. And he says, will we create structures that will allow people to be less destructive? I don't know. Yeah. And I do think that one of the kind of perversions, perhaps we might say, of psychoanalysis is to place the responsibility for psychopathology on the head of the individual. Yeah. Um, really, and then to yeah. almost, and this is like a, a kind of personal concern, to place the responsibility on me to fix individuals, which I feel like is cleaning up the mess of society. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I definitely want to come on to talk about like your experiences you know, in the, on the couch, as you, could, as you call it, but like, but, but on this point about what you've just made first, like, I mean, it occurs to me to say, think that, well, we've just talked about men in the form of toxic masculinity, but another thing that you're really interested in, which you talked about yesterday as well as part of the book, is this mm -hmm. question of hysteria, um, and so, you know, uh, one of the things that really interests me in, in, in what you said yesterday was that, you know, often you find yourself wanting to sort of, you know, there are there are schools of thought which want to, especially with the feminist tradition, want to do away with the word hysteria because it's too closely associated with the way um, historically patriarchal medical discourse diagnosed women with madness and, and therefore sort of, and, and in a sense this is also part of this locating the problem within the individual and, and, and you mentioned the the origin of hysteria coming from the, the wandering womb and all this stuff, right? Uh, and then there's an interesting part in your new book where you meant you say that when, when it actually came to one of your um, analyzans or patients or whatever, um, you know, you found yourself jumping into this mode of thinking, oh, she's hysteric because there was a challenge <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, so, <laughs> um, which is really interesting because isn't, isn't this kind of two sides of the same problem as what we're talking about with the toxic masculinity? Like, Hysteria has been used to, um, you know, locate the problem within the, the female individual when it when it should be seen as this kind of wider network of social problems or whatever. Would that be? Would that yeah, be like? no. It's really nice to pair the two because I think that they essentially have the same problem within it. And you know, I've wrestled with the fact that I I like the term hysteria and I want to hold on to it and then I wonder whether I'm I'm wrong to want to do that but the reason that I like hysteria is that in the history of psychoanalysis not psychiatric discourse or the psychiatric medical discourse going all the way back to the Greeks is that at least insofar as um, Freud is concerned the hysterics were someone who brought 
knowledge of the unconscious to him. And the hysteric was someone who, through their symptomatology, through their knowledge that they don't know, through their amnesias and their various symptoms, speaks to the disorder in the world. Um, and that this is very important to listen to. And there's actually something, there's something, um, there's something very real to me that just doing away with the term, I feel like we would be missing, which is something about the certain mode of speaking, enjoying, being dissatisfied, not understanding, um, speaking to the suffering of the sexual body. That I don't, if we don't have the word hysteria for that, then I don't know what mm. word we have. And, mm. you know, interestingly, also in the toxic masculinity piece, I wanted to go back to a very beautiful article by a psychoanalyst named Michelle Montrelet. And she wrote an article about masculinity saying that all of these ideas, for example, of either that men need to be like strong men who bring the law and bring language to the world, or the idea that men are toxic in the way that they want to bring the law and bring language to the world misses so much of what we actually hear on the couch about what men say about masculinity, the fragility of masculinity, the way that they feel themselves like masculinity is something that they're trying to put together in their own bodies, mm. um, horror at ejaculation, <laughs> You know, the, the difficult desire that men have towards other men, towards authority, you know, how do you accept as a man authority into your own life, into your own psyche, into your own body? And she says, you know, any idea of to toxic masculinity or phallic male sexuality seems to miss what we hear on the couch. And similarly for me with hysteria, I want to just stay true to what's very important to the psychoanalytic work and what we're always listening for. Mm. Um, and by virtue of that, I think we have a very different idea of what is possible in society or what society needs to pay attention to that it, it really kind of wipes off the map. Yeah, and, and there's, isn't there something, just to kind of follow up to that, isn't there there's something you mentioned there, the question of the body, and I think that's quite central in, in your work in a lot of ways. In fact, it's what the last book kind of focuses on, right, the um, conversion disorder. Like, um, and, and so you, you're sort of, and part of this hysteria discussion is to do with this isn't it the way that like the body responds to its political sort of environment and, and so on and and listening to the body as a form of knowledge that is different to the discourse the dis yeah as a, as a yeah right which is different and different to the medical profession and different to certain traditions in psychoanalysis so maybe you could say something about this kind of yeah. central body question um it's very important to me. I mean, even like, Freud said that the drive was his limit concept or concept at the limit. And this is what it meant to think um, psychosomatically. And I don't mean psychosomatically as in like you converted your psyche into a bodily problem, but the place where psyche and soma meet mm -hmm. is to, to really think at the limit. And I think the peculiarity and the virtue of psychoanalysis is always to work at that limit. So it's very important for me to bring the body back into the picture because I think psychoanalysis has been psychologized, um, yeah, right. which gets rid of the body. I think psychoanalysis has been linguistified, which is to make it too much mm -hmm. something about speaking or language. I mean, even from a Lacanian lens, although yeah. I think language is very important. But for me, the language that's material embodied speaks about the body speaks about sexuality it's different language than all of the ideas yeah. and all of the chattering of discourse in the world um so that's part of my attention to the body and bringing it back into the fold and then also to say that that on the one hand yes i do think that there's a knowledge that we don't know that's at this place in this frontier this liminal zone this limit um, and then also to follow what I think has been important to me is new forms of political discourse around biopolitics that say that mm -hmm. the way that power is felt now is felt in our bodies. And even yeah. the prohibitions that are so important in psychoanalysis that cause repressions and cause um, whatever our symptoms essentially are, like horrendous superego, it's not anymore like you shouldn't do that. It's something that, um, you know, as like a Gomben or even Preciado says, is like cellular. It's like it, it's, it's, it's attacking us from the inside out. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, that does seem in that 
context, it occurs to me that pretty much everyone that um, I've um, we've interviewed on this um, show is is a Lacanian. Um, in fact, I think one hundred percent of people are, and to an extent you are. But I do I do think it's probably worth just asking you sort of where you sit in relation to this. Like, do you see yourself as a Lacanian psychoanalyst, or as in kind of combining it with other kind of because the the the, the, the people from the history of psychoanalysis that you draw on, you draw a lot on Freud and you also draw on a lot of other sort of thinkers, less, yeah. um, you know, well-known thinkers. It's, it's, do you think of yourself as Lacanian or you don't think about I, it that way? No, I do. I mean, I... Um, it's a complicated question because I think as an American psychoanalyst, like, how, how am I supposed to call myself a Lacanian? Um, perhaps theorists call themselves Lacanians from the US but mm. if it's about clinical practice yeah. um, I wasn't in a Lacanian analysis and I've had cursory Lacanian supervisions but I was trained as a Freudian oh, okay. um, I studied Lacan obviously a lot um, but when I speak to Lacanians especially since they have these sex <laughs> yeah exactly well, that's kind of what I was getting at like, what is I don't the know limit? I don't think that... <laughs> what is the I... limit of the Lacanian I suppose is what I'm about. <laughs> I think I have my own Lacan. When I listen to them, I go, I don't know what Lacan you're reading. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. So mine, I mean, my, I, 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 I have no experience of the clinical side of it, but like did my PhD in psychoanalysis, and it's very much that I've got this very specific Lacan, I think, too. And I learned it all from Elenka Zupancic and Vlad uh-huh. and Dola, basically yeah, yeah. this kind of Slovene school. So my reading of it is really so much through that lens yeah. that now when I read it, it, it sort of fits that really rather than so it's quite specific but but I just wondered if you you know if you had something yeah you, you to an extent you think of yourself as a Canadian but you also see I suppose where the question came from is what you were saying about the body like are there key things that the Canadians often tend to miss mm-hmm. perhaps in this focus on language that you're yeah. trying to sort of build back in I guess was, was where I was going I think with that. there was I think there was a, a moment in which the like Lacan of the language game was really strong and so um, I think they missed the body but then I think Lacan himself also realized that and that's the so-called you know late Lacan, late Lacanian turn towards the real the body jouissance um, but even in that, in the kind of theories that take shape around those, the way that he brings the body back in his later work, it's almost as if he's solving an iatrogenic problem. Are we okay? I just wanted to make sure it was all fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so saying like there's the Lacan of the imaginary, the Lacan of the symbolic, and the Lacan of the real, obviously. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of maps him that way. And the kind of question of moving from the imaginary to the symbolic was very important, clinically speaking. I mean, a lot of his early work is centered on that, the deconstruction of the ego, the yes. breaking of the moorings of speech, yeah, and then yeah, the finding yeah. of one's desire on the symbolic plane. I think Lacan himself realized that he left something out, mm, the body. Okay. Right? right, and then he comes back to the question of enjoyment. He comes mm-hmm. back to yeah, the question exactly. of the real, the materiality. Although I would argue that you can see all of this in his early in, work, yeah. that it didn't like he himself was not as reified as he's made out to be when they, he's put into these periods. Mm. The problem that I have is that when Lacan of the real, the late Lacan, the Lacan of the body, which some of the Malarians yeah. are very interested in, they solve it as an iatrogenic problem, a problem that they had with the fact that they think that their theory missed this, and then they overcompensate in a kind of very, very strange way. If you're a Freudian, I mean, if you're trained as a Freudian, if you're a drive theorist, this is like, this is the ground of your work. Uh-huh. So I find something funny to, you know, sort of jump into language and then solve the problem on the back end yeah, yeah, I through the focus on the body versus to understand something about the place of the body in the psyche through the Freudian system. Mm. Um, that gives me a way of reading Lacan, I think, that's somehow very different um, mm. to the ways that they solve their problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. that's right. I mean, I wanted to come to, to I guess, and this is related to your own, um, you know, practice as a clinician, I guess, but also to this topic that the book talks about with sexual abuse, which I think is really interesting and obviously one of the more sort of controversial sort of parts of it. Um, you know, I found it absolutely fascinating the way you sort of described this. And I mean, I suppose part of it, I should, you know, I don't, it's not sort of a secret, so I might as well just say that, you know, in my childhood, I was like, there was, I had a small incident, really quite minor, where I was basically sort of 
abducted's a bit strong, but taken by a paedophile and had a very brief, not significant really, kind of encounter. And I never really thought about this as being like traumatic or myself as being a kind of victim in it. Until sort of this discourse of victimhood later appeared into society, probably well into my 20s, right? Uh -huh. Where I could see a lot, and I, I, and then started thinking, well, you know, does one sort of read back into these things and look for kind of um, these kind of traumas and so on, which are not actually there? And my sort of view is, I mean, obviously I don't know how to diagnose myself, but I think that that was basically nothing. There was no real need for me to think of myself as this, as a kind of victim in, in this kind of situation. And this comes up exactly in your book, and you talked about one, a number of patients who, who have come to you in recent years, kind of um, seeking validation from the analyst, right? So basically, and you, there's one really fascinating case by um, where you, you sort of go through, and people can, can also read about it in the book, where you go through this... Um, this individual who came to you and seemed to sort of really be demanding that you kind of validate or affirm um, that like experience that they had and basically ter like even asking you as the analyst to criticize the the perpetrator of these abuses or whatever and and that that struck me as like and, and you you actually describe in the book how you sort of refuse or abstain as you put it to be this kind of validating force that says yes this happened in this real and true way so I find that like a fascinating kind of provocation and, and it'd be great to, to hear yeah. what you think of it but I also wanted to ask whether you see this desire for this kind of validation um, when it comes to abuse as a particularly contemporary phenomenon right. I guess I mean it's 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 square in the history of Freud right because he um dropped what's called the seduction theory of psychoanalysis, meaning that um, he, was, he was hearing from patients that they were sexually abused, and he thought, well, this is what causes neurosis, this is what causes psychic illness. And then he thought to himself, well, everybody can't be sexually abused, so what do I do? And it's at this moment that he then develops the idea of the problems of fantasy and the problems of infantile sexuality and the problems of the Oedipus complex and so on and so forth. And, you know, many people said, well, this is terrible because he just erased um, the reality of sexual abuse and he was one of the first people to discover it and right. discover the problems of it. And it's not that he didn't believe that people were sexually abused. It's that it couldn't always be the case that they were sexually abused. And he didn't want to hang the difficulties of the psyche on a real external event. So a real external event might happen and it might exacerbate what's already a difficulty in the human being, which is the human beings wrestling with sexuality and the encounter between you with your childhood sexuality and adult sexuality put it in like kind of forensian terms. Forensi mm -hmm. wrote this amazing paper called um, The Confusion of Tongues Between Adults and Children, that children have a different language for sexuality than adults do, and these things are like constantly confused and clashing up against one another. And, you know, people are angry about this still. Yeah. Um, and for me, what's important though, is if you follow the, the line of this, is that the idea of traumatizing sexuality points to an idea of an okay sexuality. Yeah, right. In too much of an idealistic way, and then we lose the psychoanalytic insight on precisely the place of sexuality, the disorganizing effects of sexuality, the confusions of sexuality, it becomes those people with the bad sexuality that I was yes. exposed to. Mm -hmm. And then there's a kind of innocence of childhood, which can never be the position of the psychoanalysis. This does not mean that we condone any mm. form of abuse whatsoever. The problem is, and you know, and, and when I wrote this paper, I had written a paper for Me Too. You know, I'd written a paper saying this is a really interesting uh -huh. movement okay. insofar as women are speaking to their experiences of um, whatever, of abuse, of an encounter with the inequities between um, the sexes and the genders in, in society. However, as a psychoanalyst, we have to also remember that this idea of a person speaking for themselves is different from a person in a position of authority authorizing a person's experience, which an analyst does not do necessarily. Mm. You know, if someone comes and says, I was abused, I want to speak about it, tell me all about it. 
yeah. right? If someone comes and says, do you think I was abused? Yeah. That's a very, That's very, very complicated mm. question. Yeah. And you right. said it was one of the most difficult things to do, actually. Sure. Yeah, which it's I could very, imagine. very difficult. And I mean, in, in that case in particular, what's important about it was that we had been, I had been working with this patient for a very, very long time. Um, and I had listened to all kinds of episodes about her parents and her difficulties with it and her problems with it and the pain of it and the pain that they caused her. This was a particular moment in the treatment. So the question for me is, why are you asking for this now? Mm. What is this about in the transference? And if it's a demand in the transference, the demand in the transference meaning you're asking the analyst for something, it's speaking to something and it's also a defense against something. And this is what's more important to understand. Yeah, yeah. And I had to let it become a hot box, mm. which I was, you know, like kind of what I wanted yeah. to convey is the pressure that the analyst is yeah, put under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's not that I want to deny someone their pain, but I also feel like I have a psychoanalytic responsibility, which is not to just um, believe that I could speak for reality, which I can't do. Yeah, I think that's a really great, I mean, really interesting and, and important answer. I mean, I totally get this sense in which it's important not to be on, you know, it's it's just that, yeah, not your job is not to sort of validate the truth of it. So it's not about judging a real event. And, you, you know, this is also part of it is this kind of critical, like it's, it's yeah, it's, it's something much more complicated than that. And, and I suppose it, it goes, I wanted to uh, think also about, um, question of childhood sexuality and you, you just kind of touched on it I think a bit with this kind of I'm really interested in what you just said about this a culture really where there's the bad the bad sex and the, and the, the good sex and, and so and that, that I think that speaks doesn't it to the, the title of this book right that you're and you the way you put it and I think maybe it'd be great if you could just explain exactly what this means but what do you mean by saying that um, you know sexuality has a disordering effect mm -hmm. right because that disordering effect surely um, means that we should do away with an idea of the good and bad, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm like, this is like where I'm a really, <laughs> really good old-fashioned Freudian, because like tri infantile sexuality, as he called it, or childhood sexuality, infantile has a kind of like bad connotation to it, that it, I don't think it should, it just means young. Mm. Um, but childhood sexuality is this like anarchic, polymorphously perverse entity, you know, and this is what mm. Freud discovered. And I think like anything in Lacan about the drive um, speaks to this aspect. You know, the, like Lacan's idea of the drive is that all drives are death drives insofar as they seek to go beyond all limits that they, you know, that they can't. But it's always it's always going to push you to the furthest edge. Mm -hmm. And we have to do something with this, with our bodies, with our lives, with our symptoms, with our projects, with our whatever. Um, and it's very important because your ego, your identity, your sublimations, your families, like none of it will ever coalesce in a way in which this sexuality isn't constantly going to be pinging it <laughs> and testing it yeah, and right. pushing it and breaking it apart. And, right, um, right. and this is, uh, and I, I think I said this the other day when I was speaking, this is actually the saving grace and the psychoanalytic kind of ethos for the human being because it means that we aren't just a one-way impress from the outside. We have something within ourselves, a sexuality, a drive, that resists. It resists all of the data that's coming in from the world and it says, I don't, I don't know about that. You know, I'm going to make use of it in the way that I'm going to make yeah. use of it. And so, you know, you might say that this is something like our free will. Yeah. But it's a free will that's not anything I can yeah. will. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, I think that's a great answer. And it does seem to me that, you know, yeah, like, so, um, because, you know, this, 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 uh, this chaotic, disordering function of sexuality prohibits any kind of good and bad yeah. sex existing because it's always kind of going to be disruptive. And it also prohibits culture and from its, or civilization maybe, from sort of, getting hold of it and trapping it and it occurs to me that this is also relevant in like you know the digital age of like online dating this is one of the things I, I sort of study but like r the way in which you know data algorithms corporations companies you know try to sort of organize sexuality right. um, you know is this there is this kind of 
overarching attempt, uh, both at, at that level, but also at the level of you know the legal system and judgments and and and, and this and and the level of children should do X but not Y, as I'm sure you know. I certainly see with my daughter like those kind of messages coming from the school or whatever. Um, so you know, it seems like there's actually a massive um, attempt on the part of culture, let's say, to um, organize sex, whereas. What you're suggesting is a healthier approach would be to see it as sort of fundamentally disorganising, yeah. right? Yeah, to see it as disorganising, to see it as disordering, to see it for its multiplicity and heterogeneity, and then work from that place rather than trying to um, you know, coordinate it and moralise it, which is always the problem. It's always mm. been the problem that the minute that there's sex, there's moralization. And the internet's interesting because, on, uh, you know, on the one hand, everyone's very worried about it. I worry about the internet um, and yeah. the way in which it's like leeching onto our sexuality. Uh -huh. um, but I actually think that the chaos that it's creating all over the right, world. Right, right, right. I mean, that's interesting. Carry on, do carry on. Um, no, that's okay. The, the chaos that it's creating all over the world is something that's making us uh, reckon with our are broken institutions, actually. And, you know, unfortunately, this puts us in a very, very precarious moment, a dangerous moment, in fact, but I think a moment in which we're exposed and that we're, have to, we're gonna have to look really deep at, at the societies that we've created. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, a really interesting point. I mean, in the sense, that would be, um, I mean, if you look at this Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial that's <laughs> all over the internet, I mean, on the one hand, this seems kind of depressing that this is where we're at. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, it, it does also mean a sort of... It shows a kind of need for a very much a fresh look at all these institutions and all these yeah. discourses around sex and sexual abuse and relationships and just how inadequate our kind of current understanding right. of those things is, right? It does right. kind of reveal that. Yeah. Um, I mean, say more about... I think people, <laughs> our listeners will be listening and uh, would be interested in, like, this point about the internet. I mean... You know, when you say you're concerned about the internet, like, but, but you also said that you can see a kind of radical potential in it in some odd way. I, I mean, it's wild because we're running up, it's making us run up against our limits. As you say, like, everything kind of spreads like wildfire. I mean, and this is like, a, you know, this is an old truth about the fact that the internet has created a global community. But information and um, spectacles, it's traveling far and wide. And while it's, I think, creating chaos, it's undermining democracy mm. um, rather than promoting democracy, yeah, well, which that's, was the that's, utopian which, hope yeah, exactly. of the internet. Um, I think that what it's doing is it's exposing the inadequacy of our institutions and it's also showing us how little we understand. Because there was a feeling, kind of like, I don't know, a post-enlightenment feeling that we were like progressing in our understanding and like, look how far modern medicine has come. But actually when it comes to human beings and human relationships, we understand nothing. Yeah, I mean, this question of progress is also a part of this book, or it was is, that the yeah. previous? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, 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 it's in Yeah, this one, yeah. yeah, so I mean, that might be something else to sort of think about. I mean, you know, because... Yeah, I would say that so much of contemporary culture, even though if you look at it, especially when it comes to sort of sex and sexuality, it, if you look one glance at the internet, it shows how much chaos there is going on in our understanding of these things. But nevertheless, it is presented to us and packaged to us as a sort of part of progress, right? right. So like, right. you know, root first start with, as you said, this, you know, this, there could be, um, yeah, good aspects of this and bad, but like, you know, first rooting out the predators, then, you know, uh, opening our minds to whatever it might be that, you know, so we're, we're very much sold this, this story that we're in a moment of progress, but in a sense, you think the opposite's happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that there will be progress, um, which is probably a bad hope to have as, as a psychoanalyst, you're, you're never supposed to hope for progress. Um, I think Lacan said that at one point. Yeah, things about it. But I think the visibility of confusion is interesting, I guess, I would say, yeah, the, the, yeah. the visibility of it. And, and I know that people take some solace in that, in saying, oh, look, look at how confused we are. Yeah. Look at how symptomatic we are. Look how yeah, fucked yeah, up yeah. we are. Look how well, weird yeah, we are. Like, but that's not solving the problem of the fact that we don't know what to do, right? Mm. Um, and I don't know if that will be solved. I mean, I, there, a friend of mine, I, I mentioned this um, 
in an interview that I did with Darian Leader for Spike Magazine, but a friend of mine, Jesse Pearson, made a self-published zine that he called Psych Ward Fruit Cup. <laughs> and it's a great title. That sounds good. And uh, he called bits and pieces of things from Reddit that he mm -hmm. thought was funny. It's also very funny. Most of it was people's confusions about their sexuality. And it was sort of stunning to see this, like, page after page, like, straight out of a Freudian textbook, like, not understanding X, Y, or Z about your penis or your vagina or, like, farting or anuses or, like, whatever it was. And then also the strange things that people do and want. And you can mm. see them typing, like, is it weird that I think blah, 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 you know, <laughs> whatever on Reddit, and then everyone's, like, crazy responses. Yeah, 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 of course. And it was, like, just, it, it was the world of our absolute, you know, persistence of our confusion about our bodies and sexuality in the most naive, earnest, sometimes very beautiful, and sometimes very humorous form. Mm. Tragic, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, uh, but the, the tragedy is not that these people are asking these questions, but that, that, that there is, you know, that, that these things have to emerge, I suppose, in these kind of small pockets of the internet because right. of how, and, and is a lot of that to do with, I mean, and I suppose this connects to what we're talking about with questions of childhood sexuality or infantile sexuality. Like, is this because, like, for, for quite a long history, um, you know, we've sort of shut down discussions of, these, this kind of diverse amorphous childhood sexuality and and so people actually become adults without going through a process of understanding their sexuality yeah. or something and, and yeah. then and then it ends up coming out on reddit later on <laughs> <laughs> you know or something you know but whereas you know is, is that this other issue do you think is that why that's happening because we're not having all these we're, we're, we're what, what's the word for it we're sort of cancelling sexuality up to a certain point it's true. It's interesting. I think we are canceling. We're canceling sexuality. I mean, we're putting on display Amber Heard and Johnny Depp right. style. Um, I mean, it's very sad what happened to them. But what's the problem is that it ends up a moralistic fight over who's good and who's bad, and that yeah, is yeah. a cancellation of sexuality. Yeah, exactly. And you, you get people saying, "Come on, what do you think of it? You know, who right. do you think's in the right? You know, right. you team team her team, or team, team her team yeah, Depp. Yeah, this is really does show that you know yeah. that." Yeah. So, so what would be an alternative then to this? And and, and you have already answered this, but if we, to sort of, if we could sort of think about why specifically psychoanalysis would offer an alternative to this kind of cancellation of sexuality, because you know, psych it obviously isn't the alternative isn't saying everything's fine, do what you right, want. Right. But right. The, it's not. This you've got another. Yeah. You know, there's a, but there are other ways of approaching sexuality which don't amount to cancelling it. Right. I mean, I, you know, the broader picture of what, how society needs to structure itself to recognize the heterogeneity of individuals, the difficulties of pleasure and displeasure, the paying attention to whatever illness um, and suffering, and <laughs> suffering because of our sexuality, our bodies, our psyches, is a really, really big question that I can't answer. But I do, you know, I mean, I, I said this... Um, I say this often, is that I admire a certain moment in psychoanalysis in the 60s and 70s, both in England and in France, when the psychoanalysts were given the possibility of working within institutions. Now we're all in our uh -huh. quote-unquote yeah. private practices, but within the institutions at large, you could be in schools, you could be working with pediatricians, mm. you could be in the hospitals, mm. in different pain clinics, you could be part of OBGYN. You could be part of childbirth, you could be part of neonates. I mean, you could be someone who's there because these are critical places where critical moments in time around the life and death and sexuality of bodies is something that puts people in crisis. And you could be there to meet it. Yeah. And society could see that that's an important thing. It doesn't, right? It just wants everything to function. If a kid is acting up, put them on meds, you know, put them in a different classroom, yell at the parents, you know, they, they just want to suppress these, yeah, yeah, exactly. the instances of these things and that's also connected to questions of contemporary capitalism isn't it because yeah. it's, it's a get it's a back to work logic right so like you know you know do cbt for six weeks and then back, back into to your work. job or yeah. you know take this medication or whatever and i think this is a really important point that you're making about the role of psychoanalysis in those spaces by moving it out to private practices and stuff it then becomes this kind of cliched thing of like for the elites to talk about themselves or whatever, right. rather than a discourse which could be, you know, running through society right. and helping people to think through their 
pain in various different ways. Yeah, I mean, even I'm sure podcasts like the one that you do, or I mean, even teaching Freud to undergraduates is enormously helpful for them. I mean, I used to do it a lot. Um, I mean, now I just teach in graduate school. But when I taught undergrads who are 18, right, and you give them the three essays on the theory of sexuality, mm. you know, and they come and they hate Freud and they think he's like a coke addict, yeah. patriarchal <laughs> pervert. And then they read this, their like mind is blown and it gives them a little bit of a sense that someone can meet the suffering that they don't, they're afraid to tell anybody about. And I see it every time. But I'm one person teaching 20 kids in a classroom. Mm. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, why couldn't this be part of a, a wider discourse um, in a way? Mm. At the same time that Freud said that we're always going to be resistant to this in the same way that we're, we're, we're just, there's a resistance to the sexual nature of the human being. So, Right, right. So some of this, um, what we're sort of, I suppose, diagnosing as a social problem of um, being repel repelled by sexuality and trying to organise it and uh, deny its you know, disorganising power and uh, cancel it is actually explained can actually also be explained uh, as a symptom it's in psychoanalysis. You know because it's the construction of civilization has to kind of depend or, or has always depended on this kind of denial of sexuality at its heart and so on and. Mm, and I suppose that would also help explain, wouldn't it, like that kind of good versus bad sexuality stuff. Like, it's fundamental to us to, if we want to appear civilized, to deny the bad sexuality within or whatever. <laughs> right. Mm. No, I mean I think that's really, really um, important, really. And yeah, I mean hopefully this book will help at least to uh, you know raise this question for people. I mean what. When, when will it be out and, and what's happening with that? Maybe we can also mention the, the, the new press, press that's yeah. publishing the book. Yeah, it's um, it should be out, oh my gosh, we're already in June. It should be out next month or at oh, the wow, end okay. of this so month. That's yeah, no, it's very, very soon. Books. It's like in the, we're in like and it's the with a new publisher. That's... The publisher's, um, it's called Divided. It's run by, um, I think there's a group of people, but the two editors of mine are two women, um, Eleanor and Camilla. And... It's a great press because they're very interested in theory and they're also interested in um, new literary forms, activism, forms of writing that are like on the edge of poetry, literature, activism. And they like psychoanalysis, so... Yeah. Well, people should check out, um, of Divided. course, Jameson's great new book, um, Disorganisation and Sex, but also, yeah, Divided, the, yeah. this new publishing house. Have they already published stuff, or is this... They do, they do. Um, one of their authors who I love is Fanny Howe. I don't know if you oh, know no, her. Don't. She's really great. She's a beautiful right. writer. So, are there psychoanalysis stuff, or...? Um, I think they'll they have some in the works. Okay, great. Well, yeah. that'd be really exciting. Well, no, I mean, thanks for, for doing this and talking about your brilliant new book and also some quite controversial and complicated topics <laughs> <laughs> which you have a really um, unique pre yeah. perspective on I think a really Thank useful you, Alfie. Yeah. yeah okay thanks a lot and uh, thanks for listening guys Good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs>